Let's do it. Five seconds to go in the first half. Dante fires deep to the left. Moss caught it at the 11, but now he puts oh, it at this. To Mo oh, Williams. Touchdown. You gotta be kidding me. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Climbing the Pocket podcast. I am your host, Jason Brown. You can find me on Twitter at Brown Jason. And we are back, reunited. Got the whole crew here. JR, QB1, talk to me. What's going on, my man? What's going on, man? I'm in the middle of, you know, working as always. I'm on the clock right now doing a mock draft, so I'm over here sweating bullets. You picking for the Vikings? Pick somebody good for us, man. No, I'm not going to end up with the Vikings pick, unfortunately. All right. Well, if you're picking for the Packers, go on and mess them up, okay? I got you. (laughs) Good stuff. Good stuff. My man, wide receiver one, uh, dog catcher, cleaner upper one, Miles, how's that going? How's Teddy? Is he recovered? Uh, Yes and no. Let's, Let's just say it's not pretty when he goes to the bathroom right now, like it ever has been, but it's worse. Oh yeah, well yeah, you know. His stomach's pra- struggling. You, yeah, you practicing. You practicing right now for uh mm-hmm. for for that for that baby life. So, you know. You got the training wheels on right now. I, I feel for you. But you know to get better, I hope. <laughs> I hope. Saxy Prince, the man. Yeah, the man. The myth. The QB. Where are we now? Are you QB2 now? I'm QB2 now. Yeah, I'm definitely, I definitely has fulfilled my role as QB2. Okay. Uh, Can which, you pan which back? Makes sense. Can you pan back? Do you have the ball in your hand right now? Are you are you practicing right now? Not, not yet. As as the pod goes on, you'll start you'll start to see me get warm okay, a little bit. Right. So yeah. So what else has been going on with you, man? Uh, I know that, you, you were laying low, kind of chilling out today. What you been up to? Yeah, uh, you know, just uh we started we're supposed to start shooting this uh short film today, but you know. Um, some unforeseen circumstances happened. So, you know, just lay low today. Just enjoyed having a day off. And, uh, yeah, just been chilling, posting. I actually watched Man on Fire um, again today. Just like, I was like, hey, I need to watch a movie. So, watched it. Love that movie. Um, But on an unrelated note, I'll get straight to uh, the question of the day. Obviously, uh, some of the big things that are happening in the league, uh, more so, we're seeing a lot of these, like, you know, touchdown and celebration dances. You know, we have uh, Duck Duck Gray Duck. We have, uh, you know, we have the Dragon Ball Z dances and everything that's happening. So if y'all were to score a touchdown right now, what would be uh, your touchdown dance? Um, if, if, I had, if I had a touchdown dance, it would probably be like, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, it'd probably be like some obscure anime reference or, um, yeah, it'd probably be one of those. Juju Juju Smith Schuster's. Uh, yeah, I saw that. Mayo was was dope. I, yeah, I I, re- I retweeted it because it was it was dope. But anyways, and, and right now is like when we were talking about Game of Thrones back in the summer, and I feel like even though I can't see his face right now, when you guys go full anime, Jr's eyes just glaze over, and it's just like, <laughs> huh. JR turns into his favorite <laughs> meme when you guys start talking anime. Yo, J- JR is <laughs> like that that quarterback that like is cooler than everybody's. I know, right? <laughs> he makes fun of everybody <laughs> 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 for being nerds. <laughs> oh, so JR, man, what, what when when you scored touchdowns? We we might have to go consult YouTube on this one. Did you celebrate? Like, what what was your thing when you were scoring? No, I didn't score because. I always believe, like, act like you've been there before. And, you know, I was used to scoring touchdowns, so I act like I had been there before. So I just always hand the ball back to the rim. Okay, well, then we'll go another way since, you know, you had to go and, you know, be all dignified with your answer. What is your favorite touchdown celebration of all time? I love Cam Newton's celebration, the Superman. It completely exemplifies his personality and what he is for you know, that organization, that fan base, and for that city. So, you know, when he just goes up and rips his chest open and does the Superman, I just love that about him because it's not just a celebration. It's telling everyone who he is and what he exemplifies. 
Okay, well, uh, we'll move move on along here because you know, next man up is a wide receiver, and you know, when we think of extra- extravagant touchdown celebrations, I mean, wide receivers are definitely the first people that come to mind. So, Miles, you know, you you go out there. I mean, you gotta you gotta get this in your mind because you're going out to play some flag football with Prince in just a little bit. So you need to start <laughs> thinking about those touchdown celebrations. Uh, you know, what you're bringing to us, what, what, what's going on? What, what are you doing when you score that first touchdown? Man, I'm not a, I'm really not a big celebrator. I like, I get excited. I might like spin the ball, but I'm not, I don't really do anything too extravagant. You can get a Gronk smash or anything. Or are you just spinning it and, and walking away? I just spin it, walk away. I might, you know, give you the, I don't yeah the chest bump I don't know I'm not I'm really not that I was never that big of a celebrator anyways okay well your your homework for from this pod is you're gonna need to go online and and look some stuff up and you yeah, and I, Prince are gonna have to work out some sort of choreographed celebration that we can get recorded and put on the internet something hold on hold on hold on so I'm watching the Panthers and Eagles game and I just see Deion Sanders with hair. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. He got plugs, man. Yeah, he got some plugs. He put a video out and everything. Like he's 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 happy to have hair again. Wow, it's a midlife crisis. Oh yeah, man. I I, I dropped that in the uh, in the group chat a little bit earlier today, where where Dion is at the barbershop, just happy as. It's no longer what? cool to be bald, so he's like, it's cool to have hair. Wow, that caught me by complete surprise. Yeah, man. You know. Dion single, you got to get back in the game. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right. Oh, touchdown celebrations. You know, I think uh, for me, I think favorite of all time is the one that probably ended it all. Would probably be Joe Horn, just because that was so outlandish when it happened. Yes. That was just so ridiculous when that happened. So that was probably my. I don't know if it's favorite. We'll call it most memorable of all time. And then. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with Miles and Jr. though. Like when playing sports and stuff, I wasn't really a big, you know, creative celebration type of dude. You know, score, maybe go talk a little bit to somebody who was, you know, trying to guard you. But that was that was really it. Score, talk a little junk, and then I head back to the sideline. Yep. Yep. Good question though, Prince. I'd say my favorite celebration was probably the. Uh... I thought that Steve Smith rolled the boat one after the against the Vikings was pretty good. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, Ocho Cinco, like putting the ball. I remember that. That was a good one too. Ocho Cinco's Hall of Fame jacket one, just because he's not going to make the Hall of Fame. No, no, he's dead. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it's funny because yeah, I mean it's, he's, he's not going to make the Hall of Fame. It was definitely hilarious. I think you don't think Ocho would get in. Mm-mm. I mean, there's there are too, there are too many dudes ahead of him. Like he might eventually. It's not happening anytime soon. I don't know, man. Like yeah. when you think of how long Art Monk had to wait to get in and where he I, was on the all time list. That's, like, that's what I'm saying. Like I'm not saying he won't, but it, if he does, it's gonna be a long time. He's got a long wait. And he's also not doing what you know. Right now, there seems to be a very clear path to getting yourself into the Hall of Fame if you were a good player, which is. You know, be a good player, retire, and then immediately get yourself a job in the media where you're hanging out with all the dudes who vote for Hall of Fame and then have your friends vote you into the Hall of Fame and be in the Hall of Fame, right? Like I mean, his dad his dad's Roger Goodell, so but I, I, <laughs> I was actually I was actually listening to like one of the uh, major like radio stations and stuff and they were talking about like the rock and roll hall of fame. And I think it's one of those things where if Maybe if there was more players or something like that, you would probably, uh, or less players, it'd be probably more prestigious. But you know, there's, you know, if if you only had a criteria for just like the the top of the top, you know, you would kind of run out of the amount of guys who could get into the Hall of Fame, you know, because they they're eventually going to like catch up. So. I mean, I get why they let, you know, some of the people that they let who just have, like, really long careers get in there versus guys who, like, were truly, truly dominant at the position. I don't know, because at the NBA, I mean, if you were an all-star, like, three times once you retire, you're getting into the Hall of Fame. And all those dudes still seem real happy when they get in, and they never run out of players to put in there. So, 
mean, NBA, I guess it's not really the same. It's kind of the hall of you were really good or hall of you had some sneakers at some point versus the NFL where they seem to be real, real stringent about who they let in. Y'all think Chad Johnson getting in is going to be more of the his yards? Because, like, overall stats, it's it's really good, but I, I don't think he even – He's top, not even, not quite top 30. He's 34th all time in receiving yards. Yeah, I think Chad will get in mostly just because of, you know, how explosive he was and how, I don't know, at times truly dominant he he was, even if it wasn't for a short period of time. I mean, um, like guys like Brandon Marshall have overall statistically had a better career. Yeah. But is Brandon is Brandon Marshall a Hall of Famer though? You know he's twenty second all time in receiving yards. Yeah, and he also works for Showtime. <laughs> yeah, which I always thought was weird because it was just like, don't Good you point. feel like it's tad, tad bit conflicting at all? I mean, not if you're trying to get into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Yo, did sure. you all know that Moosin Muhammad was is thirtieth all time in receiving yards? Moosin was a bad man. I know, but I didn't know he was that bad. Yeah, he, played, too. he played for Carolina, though, so his games were never on television. No. Jake Delhomme. He killed us with the Bears. Yeah. All right, everyone, and we do have a special guest for you today. It is Packer Week, so we figured we'd bring someone in who is an expert. Mr. Zach Jacobson will be joining us today. What's going on, Zach? How you doing? Hey, how's it going, guys? Thanks for having me on. And thank you for joining us. And I will get you started off here with a pretty easy question, a little icebreaker, I guess. Yeah, no Tell us a little bit about yourself and where we can find your work. Yeah, uh, you know, I've been a Packer fan since I was a kid. Uh, you can find my work at Cheesehead TV. Uh, I'm actually a former uh, colleague of JR's back at the uh, NFC North Bar Room. Way back in the day. It feels like it was like five years ago, but it's really only like two. But um, yeah, you can just find me there, and uh, you find me on Twitter at Zach A. Jacobson. And uh, there you have it. All right. Well, that wasn't too bad. And uh, you said you've been a Packer fan for a while there, but, you know, we need a little bit more details. Where did things go wrong? Like, how did this happen to you? <laughs> <laughs> God, man. Um, actually, yeah. Pretty much my mom was actually a friend of one of the beat writers for the Packers back in the 90s, the, the, the best decade ever. Um, she, he wrote a book. He helped co-write a book actually called uh, Return to Glory. It was like chronicling the 1995 Green Bay Packers leading into their Super Bowl season, you know, dealing with uh, Favre's painkiller addiction and all that. Um, yeah, so he sent her a copy of that around when I was born and I somehow got a hold of it in like around 1999. I was four years old. Uh, and for some reason, I just, like looking at the pictures, you know, I'm four years old. I don't, I don't care about the words. I'm looking at the pictures in the book. And for some reason, I just loved the Packers uniforms. I don't know what it was. It was, it might have been the, the the multiple stripes on the sleeves or the the high shoulder pads, which I mean, everybody had the unnecessarily high shoulder pads in the '90s. Um, it could have been that, but yeah, I just fell in love with their uniforms. And then as I grew, I actually started reading the book and learning about the team. And ever since then, it just as as you would say, it all just went downhill. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So. uh Moving into the present, how are things going for Green Bay so far this season? How are things going, uh, and, and what should we really expect from this team heading into the game this week? You know, the whole theme of this team this season has just been dealing with adversity. And, I mean, every this, this is something that fans don't seem to understand. They think that the Packers are the most injury-riddled team in football right now when really every team is dealing with the same freaking thing. We're, we have our injuries. The Vikings have their injuries. Everybody has injuries. It's it's going to happen. It's just it comes down to the coaching and how you manage those injuries and how you can completely alter your game plan to work around, you know, these roadblocks. And the Packers have done that. I mean, they're 4-1. I feel just absolutely elated that they're sitting where they are right now after, after five weeks. And, you know, the shuffling offensive line, the works. You know, to be sitting at 4-1 on top of the division after five games, that's just – that's more than what I can ask for. But leading into this game, you know, first division game of the season, every game with the Vikings is just is just hard fought. 
unless we're talking about week 16 last season, which I'm not going to bring up for your guys' sake. Um, you know, it's, it's a division game, like I said, and those are always going to be hard fought. It, it, the same can be said for any division, but the Packers and Vikings, I mean, it's just, it's going to be a good one. I can say that for sure. And I guess, Jared, did you want to hop in here and, and, and get into some of the, the nitty gritty in terms of what you see as the keys for the game? Yeah, I think the biggest keys to the game for the Vikings, I think they're going to have to establish the passing attack early and often. Um, in previous seasons, what you've seen is that they've tried to establish the run and milk the clock. Do is keep Aaron Rodgers and that explosive offense off the field. And as a result of that is they were ending up in drives that ended in field goals as opposed to touchdowns. And we all know if you keep constantly scoring field goals, Aaron Rodgers, you have to end drives and touchdowns. So what I would like to see from an offensive standpoint is for them to come out slinging the ball. And I know that's a weird game plan, but it's kind of what they did against Tampa Bay and it proved to work. And I mean, if it doesn't work, I think they should just go from there as far as trying to establish a rushing attack. I'm not a big fan of trying to establish the run against Green Bay because Mike Daniels has been a tear in the middle. And they also have a very talented nose tackle and Kenny Clark who has been a great pick for them as well. So, I think the weakness of the Packers defense is by far the secondary. Um, I like high Clinton Dix. He's a good player. But other than that, I think Morgan Burnett is more of a run support safety. He's not particularly good against the pass. Uh, Demarius Randall isn't very good, in my opinion. Quentin Rollins is okay. Um, Kevin King, we're still unsure if he's going to play this week. So they're kind of hurting on the back end of their defense. So I think the Vikings can take advantage of that and try to establish the pass early and often. So, Zach, what are your thoughts on that and, and what JR is kind of thinking about the optimal way to, to attack Green Bay? Um, I guess, are you aligned with what he's thinking in terms of the secondary really being that big weakness for the team? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they haven't they haven't been as significantly bad as they were a season ago, but, you know, the weaknesses are still there. And they've managed to limit the big plays, uh, the, you know, the 20-plus yard touchdowns this season, which seemed to come a plenty last year. But – and he, he's got – Great point on Morgan Burnett. Um, he's definitely just a guy that can play in the box. And the fact that he can do that is a testament to his versatility, yes. But he's the whole reason these guys are able to shift around in the Nitro package and, you know, play in multiple positions. Um, and he might not play Sunday. I mean, he hasn't practiced the last two days with his hamstring injury, so that's probably going to be huge. And I don't care who the Vikings have playing quarterback, Sam Bradford, Case Keenum, Fran Tarkenton, I don't care. Whoever it is, it's it, that's going to be a huge weakness in the Green Bay secondary, You know, especially if they have to plug Kentrell Bryce in at safety, who isn't exactly a top-notch talent that you want manning down your back end. But you know, we'll see how that goes. And Kevin King, he has a concussion. He hasn't practiced the last two days. So that's both King and Burnett, two intricate pieces of the Packers' defense that's not – you know, probably going to line up on Sunday. So, you know, he's definitely got a great point in the passing attack. And I think that's exactly what the Vikings are going to do uh, on Sunday. Yeah, Zach, kind of just touching base on kind of some of the, the key injuries you guys have for Green Bay right now. What other players do you think could potentially be out this week or are looking like they're, you know, game time decisions? Well, it's starting to look like, uh, you know, like I mentioned, Burnett, King, uh, Joe Thomas, our inside linebacker who usually plays in the dime, he hasn't practiced the last two days. And Ahmad Brooks, the linebacker that was just signed this uh, um, a few weeks ago, I think before the season started, uh, from San Francisco, he hasn't practiced the last two, two days with a back injury. So those are just the four guys that haven't been practicing the last two days. That's still up in the air depending on whether or not, you know, they're going to be able to practice tomorrow. Actually, they don't practice tomorrow. Sorry about that. Um, but still, Thursday, this is going to be a big indicator of where they stand right now. I'm sure they're going to see individual team doctors tomorrow and kind of figure out a status for the game. But, yeah, those are four guys that could definitely play big parts uh, in the defense. And you kind of need that against the Vikings, especially, you know, Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen, which I don't know if Stefan Diggs is going to play. I mean, he hasn't practiced either. So, right. You know, it's going to be kind of just trading blows. Pretty much, who, <laughs> which team is the least injured? How's uh Bakhtiari and your your tackles looking? I know they've been out the last couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, Brian Bulaga, he should play. I mean, he's been a limited participant the last couple of days, as has David Bakhtiari. But 
that's the thing with the Packers, man. You never know what they're going to give you on the injury report. I mean, Bakhtiari right. looked like he was going to play last week against Dallas. He ended up not suiting up. And, you know, that's having him out there against the Vikings front seven, that's probably going to be pretty vital. So that may have been the Packers, the, the training staff's thinking coming into uh, last week, kind of rest him for one more week, have him ready for the Vikings because – I'm not going to gamble with Daniel Hunter and uh, Everson Griffin. That's just that's a nasty duo right there. And having Bakhtiari is going to be really vital to to kind of stopping those guys from getting to Rodgers. Zach, we appreciate you coming on the pod. It's Yinka here. Um, I so in the state of Minnesota, obviously there's this huge rivalry between Packers and Vikings. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just something that it gets the Vikings riled up every time because it kind of feels like you know, it's, 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 it's kind of that sibling rivalry where it's that older sibling over the last couple of years has always been, seems to beat us at everything, the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> so, so just, just talk about, uh, you know, maybe the rivalry on your side of things and how, you know, maybe Packer fans feel about uh, Vikings. Well, from the Packer fans I've talked to, well, at least on Twitter, um, Twitter's never a good indicator to judge a fan base, but, um, I think the Vikings are probably the most, from Packer fans, probably the most disliked team in the division just because the Vikings probably give the Packers the most trouble. I mean, especially after 2015. Like, oh, my, oh my God, I have, not, I have not heard the end of that season. It's been two years since, and I still hear some fans referencing that season. I mean, the Packers were just awful that year, but you know, it was kind of the Vikings' season to thrive. And it came down to just a, a crazy missed field goal, which I'm not going to get into that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I actually picked the Vikings to make the playoffs this year. I picked them to be a runner-up. I wasn't sold on the Lions, you know, especially given the fact they were coming from behind in the fourth quarter and, like, in, in every single game last season, it felt like. Um, yeah, then just the injuries struck in, in, in typical Vikings fashion. I mean – I'm still high on Minnesota's defense, so that's something that Packer fans can't really get too cocky with, you know. Especially after that 38-25 win last year, that I I know the Packer fans have a very good feeling going into going into Sunday, uh, given the last meeting. So that's just that's wrong, in my opinion. Totally, totally new season, totally new Vikings team, new Packers team. Everything is completely different, and that's why this can go really either way Sunday, but. You know, I know a lot of Packer fans just really dislike the Vikings, and that just that adds fuel to the fire, which you know you can never have too much of in cases like this. Well, yeah, you, you kind of you gave me a a perfect segue there, kind of talking about you know maybe the uh, Packer fans shouldn't sleep on uh, on the on the Vikings, especially given the defense that they have. So, what is a, a bold prediction that you have for this game, and then what's your score prediction for how things are going to turn out? My bold prediction, I actually, I actually I talked to a Vikings fan about this last night. Um, I have Case Keenum throwing for over 300 yards, which I don't know against the Packers defense. I don't know if that's exactly bold, but, I mean, it's Case Keenum. And to his credit, he's actually been playing very well in you know his limited games that he's, he's been on the field. So I have him going for over 300 yards uh, passing. That's whether or not Stephon Diggs plays, whether it's just Thielen running the one-man show or not. I have Keenan going for over 300. Um, unfortunately, that probably won't result in a win. But, you know, that could just be my Packer, my Packer fan I'm talking. But I'm trying to be as realistic as possible here. Um, I, have the, I have the Packers winning 31-20, which is probably going to be tough to do in Minnesota. But we'll see. Okay. All right. All right. And uh, I guess we shouldn't expect too different from you on that one there. Um I guess the last question before we get you out of here is uh, what com- what upcoming projects do you have and uh, what should we be on the lookout for? You know, the worst part about that question is the fact that I haven't had, <laughs> I haven't had access to the internet the last few days. So this entire week I've just been completely, I- I- I've done nothing, <laughs> no works. Uh, hopefully tomorrow I can get that fixed and I'm probably going to get, you know, get my creative juices flowing. I'll probably get something, uh, get some kind of, get some kind of work out there on the internet, but um, yeah, this last week has just been pretty brutal. I haven't had access to any internet at all. So yeah, hopefully they'll change tomorrow. Well, all right then. Well, I guess just before we get you out of here, then just remind everyone where they can find your work when you do actually start writing, uh, once again. 
Yeah, uh, you guys can find me on Twitter at Zach A. Jacobson, uh, Z-A-C-H-A-J-A-C-O-B-S-O-N. Or you can find me at Cheesehead TV. Uh, I, I pump out work daily, uh, excluding this week, like I said. Don't, don't use this week to, to judge me. But, yeah, you can find me at those two outlets, and uh, I'll be happy to, to engage in some conversation. Awesome, man. And, and uh, is there an option on the website to, to change the color scheme? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> oh, all right. If well, there was, I'm sure you guys would just totally make it purple, purple this, purple that, purple everything. Yeah, we, we, I mean, we do a little something, you know, like try to personalize it. But, you know, either way, we'll go check it out. Hopefully we uh, <laughs> can go over there and read some sadness from you after this week's game. But uh, thanks again for coming on. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on, sharing some of the info about the Packers. I guess JR, Miles, Yinka, anything else for Zach before we get him out of here? Go Vikings. <laughs> I, I expected that. <laughs> Thanks for uh, coming on, Zach. Yeah, I appreciate you having you on, man. Guys, I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thanks, man. Have a good night. I take it easy. All right. All right, all right. Well, I mean, you know, Zach. Zach gave us a, a wonderful segue you know, coming out there with his bold prediction, talking about Case Keenum going out there, balling, doing his thing getting his streak back in line. And, you know, there was something that I wanted to talk about today because Yinka has been, you know, running reckless, running wild on, on Twitter.com, both in, you know, in the DM and also, you know, on the timeline. Yinka, how much money did you say you wanted to pay Case Keenum? <clears throat> so, first of all, uh, let's start yes, the story uh, no, the, no. The, the, right, the right way. Um, please let us know. I, I'm not paying Case Keenum nothing. Uh you guys can pay him all you want to. But I've said this before. Um, I think a lot of people, they're excited with what Case Keenum is doing. Stop filibustering and answer the question. But just wait a minute. You got to get, gotta get the lead up a little bit. Case Keenum is obviously auditioning for his next starting role, in my opinion. That being said, I don't think that's going to be with the Vikings. So I think a team is probably going to end up paying Case uh, maybe more than we expect him to get paid. And I've thrown around this number is roughly between 12, 12 to thirteen million dollars, <laughs> or at least or at least ten million, plus, at least ten million plus. I would not be surprised if I saw Case Keenum get that money. If he if he has a few more games like the games that we've seen him do, I mean he ha- he already has the uh, he has the Bucks game on his resume. He had that comeback victory with the Lions on his resume. Again, if he puts together two three more games of a guy who looked like he could be a capable starter, I would not be surprised as a team is just like, you know what, we need a starter, we need to draft a quarterback, we need a um, we need a guy to come in um, and give our you know give our rookies some time to get up to sp- get up to par if we still need to develop him. So I'm not paying Case that amount, but I think a team is going to. So so Case turning 30 in February changes nothing for you. Nope. Nope, because if there's anything I've learned from this league is that the league tends to overestimate um, the value of a quarterback or just having a, a stable guy. Um, they more, they're more on the line of, you know, I, some teams are learning their lesson, you know, like Denver did this past offseason and not overpaying these quarterbacks. Wait, are you, saying, are you saying Denver was – they overpaid Peyton Manning before? No, they didn't overpay Peyton Manning. Okay. Just I'm just I'm I'm just saying that uh you know they they had a op- they could have had the option to go in you know go you know pay one of these quarterbacks and they chose not to. I mean, um, well, I feel like we gave Elway a little bit too much credit on that one. They, he, they tried he, to pay he, Osweiler. I mean, he tried to overpay Osweiler. You yeah, know, Houston just overpaid him a little bit more than Elway yeah. wanted. But so that's so, what I'm saying. Is, is so thirteen Keenum, mil? Thirteen Keenum, mil Keenum, is where we're putting you on the record. Thirteen mil. Thirteen mil. Okay. I'll, 10, 10 plus mil, at least 10 plus mil. I'll say that. Ten, I right, my hands mil. raised. Hand, hand raised. Uh, well, hands, on, because uh, by no means excuses or passes, but Mike Glennon, Brock Osweiler, all these younger guys getting paid the way they have been, are young. Were younger guys, and they haven't. They they had a few few sample game samples where like sample sizes where. You know, people are like, oh, there's there's some potential there. Plus, they're young, and they look the part. I, mean, I think that's the most and important. They, and part. they look the part. Exactly. Yeah, but I mean, and even even his kid's gonna be thirty. Has proven over the years he's a journeyman. I'm not saying he's hasn't improved, won't get an opportunity to be a starter somewhere, 
But to just hand that man 12 or 13 million after potentially five or six games, or, you know, obviously maybe more than that. I don't and know. Here's what, I, here, I don't here's, what, here's what, here's my other mentality as far as that too. Um, you know, with the amount of money that teams, the, the amount of the percentage that teams put into their quarterback position, 12 million isn't really that much for that position. If, if they're, you're only paying 12 million for that and maybe, you know, which number are we going with Yanka? Is it 10 million, 12 million or 13? Million? I just need a number so that we can come back and check the record. I will say, I, I will definitively say 12 million. I'll, I'll definitively say 12 million. But I'm okay. saying that JR, 12 million. Go ahead. Let's let JR hop in here because, you know, he is he is our quarterback. He, he is the one who I guess we would say knows the most about quarterback king on this podcast. What are your thoughts on that? How much do you think Case Keenum is going to get paid? And is Yinka crazy? Yinka is crazy. He is absolutely <laughs> crazy. Well, we already knew that. I mean, that that's not really a. A qualifying question right now. We already knew that que- that answer to that. No one is giving Case Keenum that amount of money, considering that he's about to turn 30 years old, unless he just keeps playing out of his mind this entire season, which I don't see happening. Um, just because, I mean, we don't know what we're getting out of Case Keenum weekly. One game, he can come and have the best game of his life. And then the next week he can come and play like he played against Pittsburgh and look looks like he has absolutely no idea what's going on. So I just don't think anybody would risk paying Case Keenum that amount of money just because he's the ultimate wild card on game day and you don't know what quarterback is going to show up. I think he's one of the top backups in the league, and I think him and his agent have to understand that's what his role is. And, I mean, Case has been a journeyman to this point, and – I think he would be content on staying on, staying in Minnesota for a while if they do come to him with the contract extension, especially since he's been in such unstable situations in his career. You know, he's coming off being with Jeff, Jeff Fisher, who was the model of me, mediocrity, and he was with the Houston Texans. <laughs> so he wants. it seems like he wants to be in a stable situation. Um, just seeing him on um, the documentary, I forgot what it was called, with the Rams, he seems like he wants to be in a stable situation. All or nothing, that's what it was called with the Rams. He wants to be in a stable situation, and he seemed like he liked it in Minnesota for the time being, but we'll see. A lot of teams throw out silly money for quarterback play, but I just don't see that happening with Case Keenum, considering he's about to turn 30 years old. Okay. All right. I think that we've, uh, you know, it is a custom on this podcast, but I think we we beat up Yinka enough for his, his Case Keenum is going to make $13 million next year take. But, you know, Yankee gets to file this one away, too. And if uh, the Jets decide they're going to spend all their money on Case Keenum or something, he can come back and throw this in all of our face at hey, a later date. Hey, hey, Keenum, Keenum's better than Glennon. He's better than, uh, you know, some of these other uh, – he's better than McCown. He's better than some of these other guys who – I feel like you're looking at this all wrong, though, because the league yeah. – I feel like we know at this point the league doesn't always go for who's performed better or who looks better on the field. They often, I mean, they, they, there's a type that they like. It's the look the part all star. It's the tall, uh, <clears throat> quote unquote, strong arm, gritty dude gritty. that they want out there. And Case is short and does not have many of those attributes that people like to sell to their fan base, which is why I think that even if he does play well. Don't you dare take that grip from Case Keenum. Yeah, yeah, he got grip, man. Don't, don't you dare you take see that the, grip from Keenum. See them YOLO balls that he be throwing down the field? I'm telling you, y'all. <laughs> I'm telling you, that is grit. Because I'm telling you, like when you look at it, like you have a guy like Tyrod who is a better athlete than Case, but he's he's doesn't look the part. <laughs> doesn't look the part. Uh, you, I, I, yeah, he doesn't look the part. <laughs> you, you're, you're a fatuation and, with Tyrod Taylor, though. No, I'm saying though, these are two players that <laughs> you can say like Tyrod has a couple of seasons of actually playing well, but he's not a tall pocket passer, and Buffalo has been trying to do everything they can do to sabotage that man so they can go and get, you know, a a guy to run the West Coast offense for them, and he continues to play well. And I think that kind of shows that it doesn't matter even sometimes if you perform on the field. If you don't look a certain way, they're going to go get the guy that they think is the one that should go in there. You can get, like, you know, Josh – what's his name? Josh Allen, strongest arm in the world, the next Cam Newton. To be their new starting quarterback, QB1 for Matt Miller. But anyway, let's move it along. We do have a game. 
this week, Vikings, Packers, Packers week, a lot going on. So uh, JR gave us a little bit of kind of his thoughts on, on, on some aspects of the game. But JR, I'll let you kind of finish up. Was there anything else that you wanted to touch on kind of outside of how you'd like to see the Vikings attack Green Bay uh, offensively? Anything else you wanted to get into? Um, that was the biggest deal for the most part. Um, defensively, they just have to find a way to consistently get pass rush on Aaron Rodgers, whether that's with creative blitzes or just rushing four. And depending on, you know, Everson Griffin and Daniil Hunter getting pressure and taking advantage of those banged up Packer offensive tackles. So if they're able to get pressure with their front four exclusively, I think they can make it a long day for the Packers. But as we all know, that's highly unlikely with Aaron Rodgers just because of his pocket mobility and his ability to maneuver within the pocket. So Mike Zimmer is going to have to come up with some kind of blitz packages, and we know he's got something cooking up just for this game. And I think this is a big game for the Vikings corners, especially if Mike Zimmer wants to send the pressure that he wants to send. They're going to have to man up those guys on the perimeter, and he's going to have to put some trust in those guys out on the perimeter, his corners, to lock up. Uh, I'm not sure if Jordy Nelson is going to play this game or not, but you know, Devontae Adams has improved, and Randall Cobb, of course, is always a threat at any moment. So just having the trust in his in his corners to play man coverage and being able to get pressure with those guys up front is going to be huge. Come on, JR. Just say Trey Waits. Just say it. Just say the man's name. <laughs> <laughs> you know we ain't talking about Rhodes. <laughs> no, it ain't it ain't just Trey. It's not just I mean, Trey Waits, though. It's McKenzie, it's yeah. Terrence Newman. McKenzie's been playing well though. Um I mean, I know he'll have he will have uh, an issue, obviously, if they start moving Randall Cobb into the slot a lot more, um, and even just motioning the running back out, you know, out of the backfield and whatnot. So, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, but at least we have Tremaine Brock. <laughs> oh, 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 man! Miles, so Miles, Miles yeah, Miles did go there. Miles, I'll, I'll let you go because you know I, I heard. I mean, I heard because I produced the show. But I heard <laughs> that, you know, when I wasn't here, uh, you know, folks weren't controlling things the way they needed to be controlled. And a certain person just took all your time and all your questions. So I'm here to make sure that that doesn't happen today. And you get the next question. Prince, put yourself back on mute. Crazy, crazy how stop, JR stop. just be stealing time like that. Y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Quarterbacks, I swear. You know, uh, what are your like, thoughts on how things are going, Miles? Sorry, repeat it. What are your thoughts on how things go? Like, what are you what are you looking at in terms of you kind know, of how the Vikings should go at things offensively? What their game plan should be defensively? Like, what are your what are you looking at in terms of you know what we should do and how you think things will play out in the game? Asking Zach a lot more of the injury questions because I'm more I'm more concerned about how their offensive line looks. You know, if like guys like Bulaga and Bakhtiari are out because that's I'm more I'm more concerned and slash hope those guys are out, then I really care about the defensive side being out. Because if Mike Daniels is healthy, he's going to wreak havoc in the middle against us. He has the last few years. Otherwise, the rest of that defense doesn't really scare me. So it's it's not really the defense that worries me so much for the Packers. It's Aaron Rodgers and that offense. If we can't get pressure on Rodgers, we can't get, you know, get to him, can't rattle him early, early and often, um, it'll be really tough for this team because – um, I'm not again, like I said, I'm not as worried about the offense anymore because I think we're going to be able to help control the clock because that defense isn't very good. They're going to let guys like Case Keenum and um, you know Adam Thielen wreak havoc, and I hope you know Diggs can come back healthy and be be effective the way he usually is against the Packers. So that'll be big. But um, overall, I I think the the biggest key is just like we had talked about earlier. I know Prince and I were talking about this earlier, but keeping Rogers um, his momentum his momentum minimum, like a lot of, can't have a lot of three and outs on offense. You can't keep, you can't give him short fields. You can't give him free plays. So if, if the, if the offense can, can sustain drives, even if it's not always scoring drives, but sustain drives and help keep the, give the defense a rest. I think that'll go a long way. Cause if this defense can, can get the, the rest they need, they're, they're going to get after Rogers. You know, Zimmer's really good at creating pressure against him and he's played against him enough to know, to know what he needs to do. And I'm getting attacked by Teddy right now. Cause he's like, you're not talking enough about Teddy and yeah, Teddy wants to get on the pod. What's going on, Teddy? How you doing, man? And, 
he's biting like crazy. Ah, man, chill. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I I think the biggest thing is is really just is Rogers and and limit limiting what what he does and his effectiveness. Hey Yinka, I just remembered what that random question was though. It was the, oh. the, ran, the random question was, should dogs be sleeping in the bed with people? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was, that was yeah. the random question. We you can know, talk about that at the very end. We'll talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I don't want to derail the pot. I feel like that can go some kind of way. But uh, man, while I got you out here, uh, what are your thoughts on, on everything? And I want you to kind of touch on you know something Miles just said there and then a quote that we've heard from a couple of people in the Vikings organization this week, which is, we want to keep Aaron Rodgers off the field. I know I'm interpreting that a certain way, but I want to understand – kind of what your thoughts are on that. I guess what you interpret that game plan to be and then how you would hope the Vikings actually um, attack the Packers when they when they have the ball on offense. Yeah, um, I know the perception obviously is, you know, it, what Zimmer was saying kind of seems like he's going to go back to his, you know, just run the ball, you know, kind of tough it out, you know, be the tougher t- run team to grind out the clock, which I think there should be some aspect of um, incorporating some, you know, unique, uh, you know, run plays and stuff to be able to get, you know, uh, to keep the, keep drives sustained and whatnot and keep Rogers off the field. But I think there's also a combination of offensively how we can be a little bit more methodical. Um, Not to say that we don't want to stretch the field um, or even, score too quickly or anything like that. I just think that we, uh, obviously we have to be really tactical in, the, in, you know, how we score, how much time we're taking off the clock. But I think it also, it, it more starts with kind of the defense with what Miles was saying. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, if, if Rogers in this game gets about, you know, seven, eight drives, you know, we're only limiting to him to actually being able to put points on the board for, um, you know, less than 50%, you know, 40% around that time, because I think 40% score in Aaron Rodgers is roughly what we're probably going to end up being able to put up as far as our team. Um, something I actually do want to see as far as the defense and stuff. And I think actually Brian Robson is going to help with this, uh, uh, what he can do in the middle, you know, obviously continuing to play that kind of QB spy role that he does when he gets, he slides inside. Um, but more, more importantly, I don't know if you guys remember 2015 when we were facing Russell Wilson, uh, the, our DNs did a really unique thing to contain Ro- our, uh, Russell Wilson. And they had, you know, right, uh, wider rush angles. So they, you know, started off, um, uh, a lot, uh, further, um, a lot, a, a lot further off the, not further off the line, but, you know, um, y'all, y'all get what I'm trying to say. They, um, they, we're just outside the tackles a little bit further. Yeah, they, they lined up a little bit wider, yeah, and they didn't come exactly. full bore upfield. They kind of exactly. went and they went to ke- keep him really. The the game plan in that game was to really to keep him in the pocket, progress, yeah. uh, uh, compress the pocket around him, but not let exactly. him you know roll yeah. out or escape or exactly. do those things that he does, and really make him operate in there. And yeah. and I know that that's something that we have done a lot in, in the past, and it's something I'd actually be interested to get Jr's take on because a lot of the time, and and a lot of the reason that the Green Bay offensive line is as good or shows up as well as it does in, in many different grading systems is because you can't really rush Aaron Rodgers as aggressively as you might a different quarterback. So I know that Jay, you mentioned, um, you know, attacking Aaron Rodgers with, you know, Everson and Daniel Hunter and hopefully generating that pressure with the front four. Would you want to see them kind of aggressively go after Aaron Rodgers? Or are you looking to, or, or would you look to see them do kind of what they've done in years past, which is, Go aggressively, but then not go too far upfield so Aaron Rodgers doesn't have any place to escape. I think I'd like to see him get up the field aggressively simply because they need to push the pocket against Aaron Rodgers. You can't just sit back there and let him pick you apart. Now, what you have to do is I think you have to have a spy on Aaron Rodgers, a quarterback spy, whether that's Kendricks or Anthony Barr. And we saw them do that in week two a lot because Aaron Rodgers was trying to escape the pocket and make throws down the field. He's not a guy that's going to escape and try to run consistently. He's more trying to you know, change the launch point of where he's trying to throw once he escapes the pocket and just make some miraculous throws down the field. So if you have a guy like Anthony Barr who's playing at a high level or a guy like Eric Kendricks just spying Aaron Rodgers and just rushing him whenever he does decide to leave the pocket, I think that would be a good idea. But 
I'm fine with Everson and Daniel Hunter getting up the field, especially with their tackles being hampered by injuries. Yeah, man, that does make a lot of sense. And kind of going a little bit further down that path of defensive game plan. So, uh, you know, Zach alluded to it. It's not something we want to talk about too much. But, you know, there was a little bit of confusion amongst the secondary and kind of what we should do and who was supposed to cover whom. As we go into this game, I guess, what are you guys thinking? And, and, uh, and Miles, I'll start with you on this one. I guess, what are your thoughts on how we should line up really in the secondary? Because there are some really tough matchups um, you know, back there, I feel. You know, Xavier, he probably can lock up Jordy, but maybe Jordy's injured, and that's not the best use of, of Xavier's talent. So I guess, Miles, what are you thinking going into this game with the injuries and everything else? What's the best way for us to line up and try to lock down those receivers? Yeah, I, I think if Jordy's going to play, which I'm guessing he's going to, I'm I'm putting Xavier on him and I'm I'm locking him up. He's the most dangerous player in that on that offense, not named, you know, obviously in, in terms of their skill players. He's the most dangerous one they have. So he's the guy I worried the most about. And then Devontae Adams is the other one because uh, he's got to go against uh, more than likely Trey Waynes then. That's the case, depending on where they line up. So that's the, that's the, that's the, the matchup that I think Rodgers is going to look for early and often. And then I think quietly the, the one that I think I'm not as worried about because I think his confidence is at a pretty high level right now is uh, Mackenzie Alexander against Randall Cobb. Randall Cobb's been banged up quite a bit this year. He always gets banged up, he seems to, at least. I think that's one I think Rodgers is going to try to pick on a little bit, but it might not go as well as – it might not go all that great. So Teddy hates your take. He hates it, but he, he, knows, I'm, he knows I'm right. Or at least he, he's like, this is what I told you before to say. So, <laughs> um no, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying they're not going to try to pick on him, and because I, I think Rogers definitely will. Rogers has seen the tape, but I think McKenzie's you know playing at a pretty decent level right now, where he's his confidence is high. So I think he'll be able to do some things against Randall Cobb that can you know help slow him down a little bit. So I think the biggest biggest matchup we really worry about is the for me is Devonte Adams. If if you shadow Xavier Rhodes with Jordy Nelson, if you don't, then all hell can break loose. And how about you, Saxy Prince? Are you uh, in line with what Miles is thinking, or you uh, think we need to go a different way? No, I, I for the most part, I you know I agree. Um, it's just I hate facing the Packers. I'm just to be perfectly honest. It's just it it seems like we can come up with a lot of different um, strategies and formulas to uh, you know how to beat this. And if if Aaron Rodgers was a is a normal person, this I think you know, we might be able to split a lot more, but the way that their offense is, is their offense is like, it truly is trash, but the the things that Rogers is able to do makes their offense look a lot better. You know, it's just like, you know, backyard football where he just escapes out of pocket and he just makes a play every single time. So, um, you know, it, it's just one, he's just one of those players where you can prepare for it, but you're never truly prepared to, you know, um, be able to handle some of the things that he's able to do um, time and time again. So, yeah, I, it is. It, and, and I know this is going to sound a little weird, but whoever is the running back for, for Green Bay, I'm hoping that that person has a huge game. And I know Vikings fans, we'd often get really upset in these games where Eddie Lacy or whomever else was running wild on us. But I almost feel like that might be by design a little bit from Zim because if I have my choice between – you know, Eddie Lacy killing me four yards at a time or four and a half yards at a time and Aaron Rodgers completely, you know, taking the top off my defense and, you know, blowing the game open. I'm a I'm gonna take, you know, Ty Montgomery or Aaron Jones and and playing the type of coverage that lets them get some yards and then doing what the defense has been doing as we get into the red zone and really, you know, tightening up and making it tough for people to get, you know, into the actual end zone. So I know it's typically a weird thing to say that, you know, you'd want the opposing teams running back to have a good game against you. But I feel like if we keep the ball in the hands of one of their running backs versus letting Aaron Rodgers kind of get loose and do his thing. Um, and I guess it goes along a bit with what JR was saying, which is, you know, really let the front four go after Rodgers and, and, and be the, the main force and kind of keep him contained. And then, you know, playing some of that press man on the outside with safeties deep and, you know, making him make the smart play, which is, you know, check into that run and, and try to take advantage of the numbers advantage. So that's the, what I'm the only, 
Yeah, the only uh, I don't disagree with you. I, the only thing that worries me about that, you know, is if the defense is on the field for a very long time because the rush, the running game is so successful. Um, where you know, let's say the game is a little bit close. You know, we go up one score, or it, you know, maybe up a field goal or whatever, and that gives Aaron Rodgers maybe like a minute, minute and a half or something. You know, I'm just worried about the defense being so fatigued for maybe potentially being on the field for for too long and then not being able to really, um, you know, do the complex blitzes or, you know, some of the other things that Zim might have that might require the defense to be a little bit more fresh than they are. So that's, it's, it's just, I, I, mean, I, I don't disagree I, with you. I mean, that. ideally, you know, ideally we can, you know, shut down the run and shut down the pass. It just feels unlikely with, you know, Aaron Rodgers led offense that we're going to be able to shut them down completely. But, you know, ideally the running back doesn't get going and Aaron Rodgers doesn't get going. I guess, what I'm saying is that uh, if I'm playing a coverage that, you know, I guess gives an advantage to either the running game or the passing game, if Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback, I'm probably going to slant my offense towards stopping the pass. And if that means I got to give something up in the run, well, we'll give something up in the run. So that's where I'm at with it. Uh, I guess anyone else have any, you know, burning takes that they need to get off here about the uh, the Packers matchup before we uh, we slide into rapid fire Bold prediction, score prediction? I had a quick one, real quick, um, to, to touch on Jared's point about potentially spying Rodgers. I think um, I think the perfect s- solution, at least in my opinion, would be spying with with Anthony Barr and letting Eric Kendricks stay in pass coverage. It's because I think, um, as we've seen, uh, Eric Kendricks is, a better, is better in pass coverage than Anthony Barr is, and Anthony Barr can use his – have less responsibility and just, just – spy Rodgers and run after him and you know how we've seen uh bar bar loves to get a little aggressive when he makes tackles so i'm all about that on aaron Rodgers. so aggravate him a little bit so i think that'd be a good scenario to do all right well while you're uh, i guess while you while your mic is live here uh what's your your bold prediction what's your score prediction oh bold prediction um mckenzie alexander has a has an interception i think the he already took it. Zach took the, the case Keenan one, so he can't take that one. Um McKenzie has a pick. Oh man, I had one more. I just you know what I'll go with um Michael Floyd scores his first touchdown in Minnesota. God, you took mine. I figured. But that's you, why uh, I yeah, but you just you, you just you threw your man Treadwell just under the bus. Thought we were gonna keep the streak alive with. Well, uh, it has you know. nothing to do with Treadwell. Stop. No, um, I mean I thought you were gonna keep. <laughs> alive. I thought you were gonna keep the streak alive of you know this yeah, is the. Week. I know. Oh, I know. That's all right. Know. You know this is what's gonna McKenzie, happen too. I've been, saying, I've been saying McKenzie is gonna get a pick for a while though, so. But nobody said anything about that. Just uh-huh. to spite you now, this is gonna be the week Treadwell is gonna go off two touchdowns because it wasn't your bold prediction this week. Too. You you act like I, I'd complain. <laughs> no, of course not. But, of course not. Um, and then my score prediction, I'm going to say 22, no, no, 27 to 20 Vikings. All right. Uh, JR, man, how about you? Bold prediction, score prediction? Bold prediction. Everson Griffin has three sacks. Score prediction. I almost had that one, JR. Score prediction. Packers 24, Vikings 21. Man. Man. JR. Don't, don't you know the rules, JR? This, really this is a Vikings podcast. This is a Vikings podcast. But I mean, JR's record isn't great. So, I mean, he says we're going to lose. We might actually win this one. Well, keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Saxy <laughs> Prince. <laughs> bold yeah, prediction. man. Bold prediction. I have a, a bold prediction on both sides of the ball. Um, I'm going to say on the defensive side, Trey Waynes picks off Aaron Rodgers again in this game. And uh, on the offensive side, I, I, I was actually can we, can say, we go back? Can we go back to your, your defensive bold prediction, though? Like, is it just that he's going to pick him off, or is he actually going to be playing well within the context of the whole game and also pick him off? No, no, he's he's probably gonna be he's probably gonna be trash most of the game, and then he'll, he'll, he'll get he'll get an interception. Uh, but okay, yeah, he's, right. he's gonna be he's gonna be that thorn in Aaron Rodgers' side because he's gonna keep baiting him, keep baiting him, keep baiting him. 
Uh, and then finally he'll get that interception. Is it baiting him? Is that what you're calling that? That's what he's doing, or is he just getting yeah. heat? Uh, both. <clears throat> and then on uh, the offensive side, I'll say uh, this will be a, this is going to be a tre- the Treadwell show, y'all. It's going to be the Treadwell show. He he's been Michael Floyd oh is back. My God. He is <laughs> he is for uh, he's been forgotten. He is the um, he was one, at once the the hope to be the prodigal son has not lived up to hopes and he's getting to the shadows and then he reemerges for this one and only game. And then he goes back into the shadows after this game, but this is going to be the game. He'll do it. Um, as far as the score prediction, um, I'm going to say 27, 24 green Bay. Wait, hold up, hold up. What you said, he's going to come out of the abyss, but what is he going to do? He's gonna score touchdowns and have oh, like I was just gonna break fifty yards receiving. Stop. Have like eighty five yards offense. Offense. <laughs> receiving. Receiving. <laughs> he's gonna throw it. He's gonna run it. Hey, hey, leave Prince alone. He's he's switching to QB mode right now. He's uh he's moving around doing his dropbacks and everything right now. So he's thinking about the game, the full offense, the full picture. I feel you, man. I got you. And and there we go. There we go. We're due for once every episode. Prince moving around, dropping back, making passes in, in, in his bedroom, and his internet just couldn't keep up. So, oh, there he is. Prince, welcome back. That. Welcome back. That. Yeah, you know the internet can't take you doing all that moving around, man. Well, I ha- I actually had the uh, the guy come out and put internet in my room, so, yeah, I don't know. Call him back. <laughs> I'm not even going to get into it. Put internet into your room when it, if you just have a wireless router, it works within. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to get into it. Yeah, just leave it there's alone. There's a few. Leave there's a few wireless wi- routers around the the every bedroom has it so that it it works like really well in every bedroom. But my my new room didn't have that, so they had to install one into it. All right, for me and for my uh, my bold prediction, uh, I'm going to say that the running backs on both sides of the ball, and when I'm saying running backs, I'm referring to uh, Jarek McKinnon for the Vikings, and I'm gonna say it's still Aaron Jones for the Packers. Each go over a hundred yards rushing, and from a score prediction, I do think this one, the yeah, I, I can see this one being a, a bit of a high scoring affair. So I'm gonna go with 31 24 Minnesota Vikings. Oh, we split on this pie, y'all. Yeah, we split. We split. All right, so we got that out of the way. Now we got to come back to the important business. Rapid fire, 30 seconds or less. JR, should dogs be sleeping in the bed with people? No, absolutely not. They're animals, not humans. That's my whole take on it. That feels very definitive. Dogs Miles should, Gorham, 30 seconds or less. Eating off the table. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs in <laughs> bed with people. Uh, no, they they should not be sleeping in, in the bed. But sometimes if you want to bring them up for a little bit to hang out, that's fine. But sleeping sleeping all night, no way. Okay. Saxy Prince. No, I'm, I'm like JR. It's a definitive no. I mean – I feel like the people who create those little doggy bag beds or whatever, those circular ones, are kind of telling on themselves and saying, like, hey, dogs aren't supposed to be in the beds. They're supposed to be on these things. So definitively, no, not at all. Get your own bed. Okay, and that'll be a no for me too, dog. So I think, you know, that, that's kind of a sweep. You know, we, we, we might have to go back to the judge's scorecard on Miles' answer there for a little bit. I don't know if JR is going to accept that one, but, you know. He won't, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, before we get out of here, I guess, JR, any projects upcoming? Anything we should be on the lookout for? I just released my top five quarterbacks for the 2018 NFL Draft. I'm on climbingthepocket.com. Make sure y'all go check that out. Um, I'll be releasing an Xavier Rose article sometime next week on Vikings territory. So that's the two things that I have on Slate right now. Awesome. Miles, new computer up and running. What's going on? What uh, 
Can we expect anything? Top five uh, draft prospects uh, receivers next week. Yeah, like it. Looking forward to it. Saxy Prince, my man. It's been a little yeah, while. Hey, what's going on? Yeah. I feel like we haven't got to this question, me and you here in just a little while. You know, what's going on? What you working on, dude? Well, um, a certain quarterback should be coming back into the fold a little bit, so I'll probably have uh, something dropping about that. Um, Wait, the, the, the Teddy article is coming out? Finally, yeah, man. yeah, man. It's 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 been a it's been a work in progress. I don't know. It's you know when you just have those 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 brief weeks where you just have had writer's block. That's kind of been me over the last couple of weeks, which is why it hasn't been as much content coming out for me. But uh, more stuff is coming to my brain as we have conversations and stuff. So um, that definitely has helped. And uh, yeah, man. All right, we'll be on the lookout for it. So I will link to JR's piece in the show notes. Uh, I think Flip put out his top five plays, so I'll link to that as well. And then uh, myself, Luke, Eric, dropped the Pocket Protectors podcast yesterday. I'll throw the link in for that. And then, uh, you know, I guess at some point here, we'll uh, we'll have to figure out the schedule and start to tease this other thing that we got cooking for y'all. But uh, yeah, I think that's it for everyone this evening. My name is Jason Brown. Once again, thank you for joining us on the Pocket Protector. Uh, see, look at me. Just said the Pocket Protector podcast instead of Climbing the Pocket. Too much going on. On the Climbing the Pocket podcast, join us even by JR, Miles, and Yinka. Y'all have a good one. Rest in peace, Dennis. <laughs> you just had to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I got to go.